Okay, hello everyone. My name is Dimitris. I work at CLMS and I am a software engineer of the Zabdev platform. And today I am going to introduce you to introduce to you this platform. And then we are going to have a live uh, tutorial live session on how we can extend the code generation process in order to generate some new stuff. Um, so let's start and see what is Zabdev. Zabdev is an MD approach, approach to low-code development. It uses models to encode the different semantics of the applications, i.e. the domain model, the UI layer, the integration layer, etc. And then these models are fed to code, coding facilities implementation strategies, which generate native source code. Uh, we have three main components in the Zabdev platform. The first one are the MD visual editors, which are the editors where you edit these models. There's a business model editor, a UI editor, etc. Then there is a Zabdev meta model where all these models are combined, are validated, and are fed to the implementation strategy, to the coding facility. And the, the final step is the code generator, which we'll call an implementation strategy, take, which takes and simples this meta model and generates native source code. And now we are going to have a, a look at the high level uh, mod, meta model uh, of, Zabdev, of the Zabdev meta model. First of all, we have the data layer where we have the entities, the classes, the properties, their associations, semantics about their database persistence, etc. Then we have the integration layer where we can integrate with various external systems, uh, databases, REST services, soft services, messaging, PubSub, etc. On top of this data and the integration layer, we build, we build the business layer where the specifications are. And using workflows and operations, we have developed a custom language, a high level language, uh, in order to be able to write code. Uh, we use this language in all the layers of the application development, and the implementation strategy is responsible to convert it, transform it to the best technology, uh, be it SQL, uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, C Sharp, etc. Then we have the service layer where we can expose functionality to other systems through REST APIs. And finally, we build the UI of the application using form editors, themes where we design the design, design system of the whole application, etc. Now, uh, we are going to see what an implementation strategy is. Uh, the implementation strategy, as we said before, is the code. The code generator, it takes as input this meta model we talked earlier and it generates code. It is uh, completely separated from the meta model, uh, giving us the ability to generate uh, code for different stacks without having to do any change to our models. So, by just clicking a button and changing the implementation strategy, we can generate a completely different stack uh, from the exact same models. Uh, there is no assumption of any runtime libraries. All the implementation strategies are based on open source technologies and frameworks, and they are well, always kept up to date. Uh, so you don't have to worry if uh, a library updates or a, a framework uh, releases a new version. I, when uh, .NET uh, releases the new .NET, .NET 7, you just rebuild the application, and all your applications are, uh, are using the latest technologies. The implementation strategies are extensible and relative relatively easy to modify. Uh, for example, we can uh, completely replace the ORM, the persistence layer of the application, from using, let's say, in Hibernate, to using Entity Framework. And you don't have to worry about the REST application. Implementation strategies are built that way, so it is easy to plug and play different components of the, of the application stack. They can be written in any language. And there is no risk of vendor lock-in. We don't have any runtime dependencies or a custom runtime engine. We just generate native source code, and uh, you can always download the source code and uh, run it independently. Uh, here is a simple example of different implementation strategies. So we have the same meta model, uh, many different implementation strategies. For example, two. <laughs> That generate uh, the web stack, full stack web application. The one is using the first one is using Angular and .NET Core. The second one is using React.js and SJS, uh, which is based on the Node.js uh, runtime engine. 
So just by uh, changing this implementation strategy and rebuilding an, the application, the code uh, will now be generated with these technologies. We might generate code for different platforms. Uh, for example, here we have a strategy that generates code code for the for mobile uh, platform using React JS and React Natives. And you can always create your own implementation strategy, or by copying stuff from here, or by writing uh, from scratch. Today, uh, we're going to see an example of a dev application, a very simple application, feed it to a selected implementation strategy, generate some code, and then go <coughs> after the implementation strategy to generate something new. Uh, we are going to generate these uh, basic classes, a customer and then address class, order and order details, and the service layer for the customer crude operations, create, update, delete, etc. And we will expose them as a REST API. These are the classes. The customer class uh, is connected to the address class and the order to the order line. We have association with different multiplicities. For example, order has many order lines. The customer might or might not have an address. Uh, this is the stack we are going to modify. It, uh, it generates codes for the code for the NetJS framework, which is a Node.js framework for building uh, server-side applications. And we will focus on entities, that mean classes. The, uh, the ORM, uh, the database persisting persistence where we will use the type ORM library. We will design the service layer and the API layer. Uh, expose it and, and we will expose it as a REST API. And uh, what we are going to do to change it, we will uh, generate code for the data contracts that the feature. Uh, this feature enables us to <laughs> narrow down the, the data we are exposing to other systems. So for example, instead of exposing the whole customer model, we just want to expose two basic properties, his name and his head name. So, for each data contract, we are going to generate a new class, uh, which will have all the selected user properties and two functions. The first function will take us into an entity and convert it to a DTO. And the second function will take the DTO and convert it back to the entity. So when we have these functions, we will go uh, to the API layer and uh, change it in order to call these new functions. So the API layer will not expose the whole customer, but the a specific DTO. Okay, uh, before we start the live workshop, I will go to the live Zabde platform in order to, to understand better what we just uh, saw, and then we will start the live tutorial. Okay, uh, this is the Zabde platform, it is online. Uh, you don't have to download anything on your computer. Mm -hmm. uh, you can create as many applications as you like. Each uh, application has an implementation strategy. And let's see what each application contains inside. Here on the left, we can see the uh, Project Explorer. We have all the models uh, separated, grouped by their category. We have the domain layer. And let's see what each one of them is. Uh, here we designed the entities. Um, it's a UML-like editor. Um, here we have the customer class. It is connected with an address class. Uh, by clicking here on the property grid, we can view various semantics that we can alter. So for example, I can select if this customer will, if this class will be persisted to the database, what its primary key is, if it has inheritance, etc. Uh, we can configure the associations. Uh, we can uh, write custom uh, logic here on the operations using uh, this language we have developed, which is a high level language. It looks uh, like C Sharp or Java. And it is generated to a target uh, technology then. Okay, this is the customer. Now let's go to the UI layer. Here we designed the UI of the application. Uh, this editor uses the MVC, follows the MVC pattern. So here on the right, we build the view model, the model of the form. Uh, by using classes we have already defined in the domain layer or in the service layer or in the integration layer or 
we can just uh, define new classes here. Uh, on the center, we have the, the UI editor where we can uh, drag and drop various components and place them wherever we want to design any UI. And we have the controller section here, uh, which is responsible to handle the communication between the UI and the, uh, and the model. Okay. Now, I am going to the integration layer. We call them API adapters. Uh, so here you define uh, various integrations with various services, as I said before, with REST APIs, SOAP APIs, databases, uh, queue systems, etc. And basically, an interface layer is just a set of operations with a specific data contract. They return something, they take something as input, and they return something else. The service layer. Here we expose functionality uh, for other systems to consume. Uh, here, for example, is, is the customer CRUD that we are going later to generate. It has a create method, a get, count, get all, etc. And the data contracts feature I told you earlier. Uh, here, it's the customer class, and I select that I want to expose only the first and the last name. I don't want to expose the ID and the address of the customer. If I want, I could click on the ID and it will be exposed. <coughs> Then we have the automation flows model, which is uh, actually a workflow model uh, which supports scheduling, pending jobs, uh, etc. You can define with a visual uh, way various workflows. Here you have a sequence flow of uh, various steps. You can add uh, for each, while, uh, if steps. You can start executing another wor uh, workflow. Okay. And we have the theme model where we design the whole uh, design system of our application, the colors, fonts, font sizes, uh, etc., which are used globally on all the, the UI models. Uh, so on the application configuration model here, we can select the implementation strategy uh, of this application, uh, which is the engine that will take the meta model and generate, run, and deploy our code. Um, we can always validate our models to see if we have made any mistake or something is inconsistent. And let me show you an example. I will open this one, the NestJS. This is the application we will generate in a minute. And here, for now, I have selected the Angular JS implementation strategy, so we can see that. The generated code follows this uh, this uh, stack. We have the web folder with uh, the controllers, the front end code, etc. And at any time, I can change this implementation strategy. For now, I will select the NestJS. I will save. I will hit the build button, which triggers the generation process. First the validation, then the generation process. Uh, down, I can see the feedback. It is finished. And if I now browse, browse the source code, let me refresh here. Okay, now I'll see a completely different source code. Uh, here is Node.js and uh, Nest.js. Here are the entities. It's in TypeScript, etc. So that's how Zabdev works. We have the meta model, the implementation strategies. The meta model is fitted to the selected implementation strategy. The code is generated, deployed, and it can be run. Okay, that's all from Zabdev. Uh, before we proceed to the live part, maybe there are some questions. Question I have a yes. the demonstration is looks really good. Um, you also mentioned on the slide that you uh, you can um, even deal with updates and libraries and yes. dependencies. Right? Yes. So what about breaking changes in those libraries and certain contracts no longer hold true? For example, certain data is no longer available. Yes, that, that's a, a valid question. Uh, we try to handle these changes inside the implementation strategy code. So the user, uh, the, the model designer, doesn't uh, have to worry about this stuff. Um, if... Uh, Sometimes it can still bubble up to the level. Yes, yes. If... Uh, this comes impossible. We throw a validation error during build, and the user has to take some action. It's very rare, but it can happen sometimes. But the idea is that we try to to handle that in the implementation strategy code. 
Any other questions? Yes. Um, so if you rename things in your model, yes, and you already have some data in your database, yes, you also rename the tables and the yes, we we have a. We have a separate uh, hidden model, let's say, that keeps all these changes that uh, affect, that possibly affect the database, mm -hmm. and in, on each build we apply them, and that <coughs> it keeps in sync with the uh, version control. So if we roll back to a previous version, all the pending migrations, let's say, are applied, and the model comes back to the state it used to be. The the ID has uh, integrated visual uh, version control. I forgot to say. I guess related to that, when you make a small change to your model, say when you move a field yes. uh, by your yes. pixel, and then you build again, is this an incremental build or do you have to regenerate? No, it's incremental build. We keep track uh, of the changes each time and uh, we build only when it is needed to, to something to be built. We actually keep a hash of the, the changes that affect uh, the generation. And when this has code changes, only then we build again. So if I just move something uh, and build, uh, nothing happens. The code stays the same. Stays the same. No, but I mean, if if say only one entity was changed, would you regenerate the entire? No, we will generate only this change. Only but uh, the whole project will need to be compiled because it's a compile. Uh, the the .NET uh, needs to be compiled, but only this file will be generated. Other question? No. Sir. Of course. All this is your experience. Or there's a lot that people have to model in order to build an application, right? Um, what's the sort of expertise that somebody's got to bring to this to build that? And what do they to build an app? Yes, and, and, what, and, and what do they want to need to know? So what does it save them from going to, to, to this sort of approach over building to that? The uh, various level of uh, experience can use this uh, from very junior developers from to very senior developers. Each layer uh, can unlock uh, uh, different features. If a, a junior developer can develop applications, he doesn't need to know uh, stuff about the uh, persistence of RM, how the data is moved from the client to the server side, serialization, deserialization, etc. He just designs a form and domain model and somehow it works. Uh, if you happen to know this stuff, how they work, you can uh, uh, build better applications because you have that knowledge. But the junior developer can use it. Uh, Easy. But it requires some sort of technical affinity. Yes, okay. yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> but then, you don't have to pass. Yeah. Uh, usually, you need some kind of database to model this. No. Yeah. To model the, the, the entities and the relationships, that, that kind of modification. Or some kind of program as well. You know, although, there's Play with drag and drop and you can drop an object and then the system automatically will generate the food operation, for example. But if you want to go a little bit further, then uh, certainly uh, the language itself is an object oriented language, so the program uh, knowledge uh, will be helpful. Although it is you know, the experience in the students to learn how to program. So very quickly, you can pick up on these uh, facilities the platform provides, and you can be product to say the way. So, obviously, if you focus uh, on this platform, you need to be able to deliver. Yeah, like a case, so you can get the right application. Okay. Other questions? No, so I proceed to the, to the live workshop. Okay. Um, first, we need to clone a repository containing the this strategy we are going to to change. The repository is here. I don't know if you want to to clone it. <coughs> I will start here.
Okay, what we are going to do now, first, we will uh, run the implementation strategy, we'll generate the code, we will review the generated code, we'll review the code of the implementation strategy in order to understand how it works and how we can extend it, and then we are going to actually extend the implementation strategy. So, uh, here is the clone directory, I will open the, the project. It can open with Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. It works on Linux and Windows uh, machines. Okay. Uh, there's a small configuration I need to make on the app configuration, which is the path where the, the application lives, the meta models, which is this one. Copy. Excuse me. Paste it here and here. The static files are just some files that are uh, copy paste as it is on the generated solution because they don't change the, with the model. And the application path is where the, the meta models live. I have downloaded the meta models and uh, added the, uh, them to this folder. So now I will hit the run button and hopefully the code will be generated. Now it's it's building the, the solution meta model. It validates the meta model, and the generation finished. Here is the path that my code is generated. I will copy it, and let's view this code. Okay, next sample. Here is a generated code. I will open this with Visual Studio Code. And we will have a quick look at the generated code, first of all. Uh, all the code is generated inside the source folder. And uh, let's start from the entities. Each class generates a TypeScript file containing the class definition with some ORM semantics. Let's view the customer entity, for example. Let's format it. Here is the customer class. Uh, it has all the properties I have defined in the Zadev model. Some annotations uh, that are used by the type ORM library in order this to be persisted on the database. Okay, then for each service I have on Zabdev, a service file is generated here. I have a customer service containing all the crude operations we saw, create, get, count, get all, save, delete, etc. Here we can view the, the Zabdev language code generated into TypeScript. So let's put it together. Here we have the service layer, the create. The implementation code is this. I take the customer, I assign the ID to zero, and the registration uh, date is equals daytime dot now. And this is generated to something like this. This code generation engine using the, the, is using the moment library to handle dates. And then it calls the save uh, fun, uh, function of the repository in order to persist that entity to the database. That's the service layer. And finally, we have the API layer where uh, the service we saw earlier is injected uh, on the constructor and it's being used by each operation. Here, for example, we have the create, it is marked as post, and inside it calls the, the service create method and returns the create, the create uh, response. So here we see that uh, create returns the whole customer, so the whole customer will be returned as a JSON to the customer. This is what we want to change. We, will, we want to return only some properties. Okay, I will install all the dependencies of this project. I am using the YARN package manager. Okay, we leave it there to install it. And uh, while it does that, we will examine the implementation strategy code. Um, let's start from here. Each implementation strategy must implement an interface uh, called engine. Uh, this is the engine that takes the meta model as input and starts the generation process. It, have, uh, it has a session object which contains some uh, details like the output path and the, the meta model itself. The generate method uh, 
prepares the code generation, it actually creates all the folders, then it sync the static files. It's the folder we saw earlier, which it is just copy paste to the runtime. And then for each layer of the application, we create a service class. This service class actually uh, queries the meta model to get all the, the uh, to get the part of the model that it needs to generate, and it calls the appropriate transformers to transform each uh, small part to to source code. So let's view the domain model service and go to the generate function. Okay, here is the main query that queries the whole meta model uh, to get all the persisted classes, and for each uh, class, it calls the entity generator which actually generates the class uh, file we saw earlier. Let's see here, domain model, uh, entity generator. The code generation is actually a code concatenation process. It uh, has ifs and for each in order to generate the final code. So here, for example, export class, and we use the dynamic class name of this model that came as input uh, to us. Okay, the service generator, it has uh, the service, uh, service, excuse me, the export service. It has many generators. It has the API generator, the service generator, and the DTO generator. The DTO generator is empty now, and we will fill it in order to generate the data contract details. Okay, let's go back to Visual Studio Code. All the dependencies are installed. Uh, I will quickly create an empty database. Sorry. Create new database test. Okay. And the DB name is test. My password is root. Okay. And let's run the solution. Yarn start. So now uh, we will hit it with postman and ensure it works. Okay. It's, uh, it's there. It listens on the 3000 port. And here I have a postman collection, so we can test it. Okay. Uh, I will call the get method, the get all method. Empty response because we don't have any entities. Let's call the create method. Okay. The sample name and surname. The entity is created. So if I again call the get all, we will see. Uh, the customer persisted to the database. And if I go to the empty database here now, it will be filled with tables. And if I select the customer, test. here we see the customer we inserted from the API layer. Okay. Now, here we see that the whole model of the customer is returned its ID, its registration date, name, and surname. We just want to return the name and the surname to expose. So that's why we have the data contract feature and we will implement it now on this implementation strategy. So let's go to the implementation strategy and we want to alter the DTO generator. Now the DTO generator does nothing. It uh, creates an empty string builder and returns. Uh, first, we will write the code we want to generate and then we are going to generate. So I will go to the to our runtime. Here it's a completely empty class, and now we will we are going to write the code we want to generate. As I said before uh, during the presentation, we want to expose uh, one class for each data contract defined by the user. The user has defined only one data contract here. For the many actually, I will uh, write this one, the customer, and has some properties. So I will export the class. I will name it customer DTO. This is a convention. Okay. We wanted to expose all the properties. So, um, was the name, data type string, set name. Only the selected properties, not all the entity properties. And then we want to create two methods. Uh, the one that will transform an entity to a DTO. Let's write this one first. It will be a static method. I will call it to DTO. It will take us input a real customer and customer entity. 
let's call it entity to be more generic entity domain dot customer and it will return a customer DTO. So here let's define a DTO variable of this type and return it. DTO. And here I will just need to copy the properties from the entity <coughs> to the new DTO. So I will write DTO dot name equals entity dot name dto dot share name i forgot any equals entity share name okay and the opposite uh, function it's i will just copy paste it i will name it to entity we'll do the opposite thing it will return an entity We'll take a input a DTO. DTO, DTO, customer, DTO. Okay. I think here the auto import is wrong. I need to import domain slash index and import everything as domain. Okay. The casing is wrong. So this is the code we want to generate for the, for each data contract method. I will uh, copy paste it somewhere so I don't lose it here, for example. And uh, now let's see how we will generate it. I will go here to the render class method and I will start appending code to the code builder. I said I want to do this for each data contract. So first I have to iterate all the data contracts defines, defined in this service for each data contract in model Telia data contracts. And I will separate uh, each thing I want to generate in a different uh, function. Uh, first of all, I want to Line by line, we will generate this. I need this one. Copy, paste. And the customer part here is dynamic. So I will take it from the data contract dot name. Data contract dot name. Okay. I will close the class the class bracket so I, I won't forget it later. Okay. And now we want to generate the properties for this class. So I will make a new method, append properties. It will take as input the code, the string builder, so I can append there, and the data contract I am working on. Okay, let's generate this method. And here I just want to uh, uh, iterate each property and generate one line for each one. So here I will do bridge var prop in data contract dot properties. And I'm going here, data members, yes. Code append line. This one. Now I have two dynamic parts, both the name and the data type are dynamic. So here for the name, I will use the prop dot name. And here I will use a, a helper, the data type transformer, which takes and input a data type and transforms it into TypeScript data type. Data type transformer dot Transform prop dot data type. Ask, yes, of course. Is that data type transformer, this is a strategy, right? I mean, yes, yes, and it is, it is, pro, uh, it is provided as an interface 
And when you design a new implementation strategy, you have to fill this interface uh, in order to the, the implementation strategy knows how to transform each data type to another data type. And for each method uh, of the standard language, the, you, you need to, you to implement this interface. Okay. Um, I will run this code and review what we have generated so far. Run. Excuse me. I need to set this as main project. <coughs> okay. Here we see the code we have generated. First of all, we have made a mistake here uh, and appended a dollar sign. I will remove it. And you see that for each uh, class we have selected, a new class is generated. So let's remove this dollar sign here. Okay. And uh, here I need to do this. To take just the data type name, not the domain dot data type. Okay, and now let's finally generate the 2DTO method we need in order to call it to the API layer. Uh, append 2DTO method. Again, it will take us input the code uh, string builder and the data contract. Okay. Now I need to generate, excuse me, I lost the code here, this one. So let's take the header and code <coughs> append line. And now the dynamic part is this one, the domain.customer. So I will change this with data contract.name. I will close the brackets of the function. Okay. Then I need to I need to define this uh, excuse me this variable here the dynamic part is then it's just the name of the data contract here so i will replace this with this here we need the dot data type name let's return it return dto okay and then I will just iterate the properties as I did earlier in order to generate the assignment lines. I will copy this, the for each property, and I want this part here. Copy. And here the dynamic part is this one, which is the prop dot name. And here. let's run again to review the new code. Okay, so now each DTO class has a 2DTO property a method. It does what we want to do. It creates a DTO uh, variable and assigns all the user selected properties. Uh, now the only thing I'm missing is the import statement. So a part of the generator class is a function called render imports, which will return all the imports uh, this uh, file needs to work. I will copy it. From, of course, of course, always. So, um, in this implementation, you kind of you kind of assume that all the properties in each of the DTO are primitive types, right? No, uh, the data type transformer also handles uh, complex types. Okay, so I, I understand your question. Yeah. I need to add an if there and check if it's a complex pro pro uh, property to call the appropriate to DTO uh, method. Okay, I see. Yes, uh, we will do that later if time allows. But you are correct. Can I can I while while you're asking the question, can I ask yeah. um, Of course. So so I I, I noticed that you've built a new generation to line by line. Yes. Uh, composing it. Does that mean you've got to manage things like indentation, etc., as well, if you care about that? Uh, uh, that we that we do. What we do is that we have a, a function that runs after the code generation process that uh, adds identifiers that predefines the code. Okay, and yeah. we we start running this only if the user clicks to download the code. 
if he just builds in order to to, to run the, the application, we don't run this to to buy time okay. to make the build process faster. Okay. But that assumes we're not generating pipes. Yes, of course. Then we have to turn the implementation in the code generation process. Okay. But now we don't care. We're just uh, adding lines. So maybe a follow-up question. <coughs> I think that in previous versions of uh, of that dev, they used to have a template uh, language. Yes. Yes. What motivated the change to this kind of concatenation based? We used to to use ASP.NET ASP template. Yeah. Uh, it became too complicated inside the templates to handle all the code generation. Uh, actually, now we have a hybrid. We use both uh, templates and uh, code generation for the most difficult parts. So, uh, this, for example, we, we would use a template because it is uh, simple. So we use a hybrid now. But it, it is up to the, the developer of the implementation strategy. The libraries you inherit have both uh, the template version and this one. Right. Strategy is actually a program that takes a meta model as an input and transforms it to another to native source code. It it's it can be written in every language you want. It makes much easier the debugging process as well. You know, to debug a, a code generation engine. Hmm. Well, and, uh, okay, I just import the yes yes yes. Perhaps on the same same subject. So. Uh, previously, you showed us this code snippet that is uh, Zapdev uh, DSL or something like that. Yes, used yes. To uh, uh, create hard services, right? You mean so, uh, 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 create uh, this one? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, is it not like can this language or this kind of syntax not be used to create? Um, in like association with your uh, implementation. Uh, no, I mean like uh, the, the the thing that you're creating right now, the code generation. The code generation. Yeah. So instead of writing like this concatenating strings and stuff like that, we write this function and this function basically is used for generation. Of Provides a transformation. Yeah. Yes, it could be done. But is that already supported in the tool? Uh, not yet. No. This is by. By design, so if, we have, if, if we do that, that means we'll write in another language. We can use Ruby, which has this meta programming feature. So we want to implement this type of implementation characteristics to this language. This language is for programming the business logic. We have the flexibility to extend this language in order to support all the implementation features supported by various technologies. But from the perspective, we didn't want to use that language. Because this language has a course grammar, a compiler, but it doesn't generate any executable code. The compilation process is this uh, process that transforms this code to another source code. This, uh, this is more it's more like a transpiler, not a compiler. No, I'm asking fine. this question because sometimes when you are generating videos, they are also doing some processing. For example, instead of returning first name and last name, you want to return full names. Uh, yes. So you have a yes. there. 
This and then uh, this uh, way of generating a DTO class will not allow you to do that because then we really have to go back to your uh, domain model. Domain model, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing you mentioned will be a feature of the data contract meta model. So here on the data contract, you could define a new uh, property with, which does not come from the domain model, but it's a calculated field. Okay. So we would add it to the meta model language. The exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. It's a much simpler way to do it in the, at this level, you know, at the model level, yeah. rather than handling that at, at the code level. Okay. Now we have generated what we want uh, for each data contract, a DTO class, a two DTO method, and now it's time to go to the API layer and use this uh, method. So I come here to the API and let's think how we can do it and then we will, we will generate it. I will do it on the get model, which returns a customer. So here it just calls the service and it returns the response as it is. I want to import the newly created uh, DTO and call the two DTO method. So I would do something like that. DTO. Let's import this dot to DTO, the method we created. This takes as input the input, the, the output the server, the service returns, and converts it. Uh, because this is an async method, I need to await this. This is a node feature. And in order to await, I need to mark my function as async and uh, return a promise of something. Okay, that's the code I want to generate. I will first test it to ensure it works. So I will restart my server. I will go to the postman and here instead, let's call the get method we modified. Okay, now only the name and the surname is returned instead of the ID, the registration data, etc. So let's go and generate uh, uh, this change. Stop. We, now we will go to the API generator. Okay. The API generator queries the meta model, takes the, the model it needs to generate, and for each method, it calls the render operation method. The render operation method uh, appends the, the annotations for the get, post, put, delete, etc. Uh, first of all, I need to change the return data type from any to promise to any because I need to mark my function as a sync. So I will change this one here. Okay. And here is the line that defines the operation. I will add the async keyword in front of it. And now I need to conditionally call to DTO method. When I need to call this, when the function returns a complex data type. If it returns a string or an int, I don't need to call the to DTO method. So somehow I need here to check if the return data type is complex. So if uh, OP, which is the operation I'm generating. Signature holds the signature, the return data type, and the parameters. Return data type. Oh. It's complex. Uh, no, it's. We have a helper library which called primitive data types. Primitive data types. Oh, excuse me. Let me check something. It's called mm. Ah, okay. I just check if, if uh, it starts with the domain prefix. If it starts with the domain prefix, it means it's an entity, a complex data type, and I need to generate uh, the two DTO method. So if needs DTO is true, I will generate something else. I will generate what I used to generate this one. Copy, paste. So here I need to call uh, the customer uh, DTO. Let's copy it from here. 
all this. Copy. Paste. Close the parentheses here. And this one is the dynamic part. Which is the... Um, excuse me. Var data type. So I will copy it again. Save some time. Okay. And I need this. Copy. Paste. Okay. Let's run it. Okay, now this one changed to async and it calls the to DTO method. I just need to import the DTO's uh, file import. Like yes, DTO's from at DTO slash exposed slash Okay, and I am going to append this. Copy. On the code generation, on the render import function. Enter, paste. Okay, I think it is ready. Okay, now the code looks fine. Let me run it again. And hit. Okay. So now we have completely generated the data contract feature. It's simple. Uh, we don't generate it all uh, in use cases like the one you mentioned before. But uh, for the demo, I think it is uh, okay. Uh, do you have any questions? Something you want to see? You mentioned that at this point you have a hybrid approach between templates and yes, and yes. Alignment. So if at this point I'm quite happy with what I've done and I would like to template those things, can I lift this up and put this into a template? And yes. Give other students? Yes. Uh, we use a simple template, uh, actually TXT files, with a bracket syntax for the dynamic parts and uh, a section where you define all the imports the inputs and we have a function uh, uh, render template takes us into the txt and all the inputs and render it so yes in this case i would copy paste this into txt file add inputs on every bracket add some for each etc and uh, call the templating engine but it's but you've got to do that on your own right so you've got yes the code, yes yes it's yeah. a preference. Uh, you might prefer to write like this. You might prefer to use the template uh, version. Did, did you consider using something like eGML? We we could do it. Yes, we we haven't considered it yet. Uh, we so have tried the ESP. Yes, it fits the, the use case. <laughs> Sometimes the developers feel more comfortable with the, with the language, you know, I mean, you can define you can you can whatever you like with the programming language, right? I mean, maybe, and if you have to generate complex stuff, you know, if you're building a big, big system, but you would need to generate complex architecture, for example. Framework like EGA, you may find yourself at some stage in it. You can build that with uh, Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Then, uh, and uh, if you uh, have a team decided to build an implementation site, a code generation engine, and there are different types of knowledge there that they may want to reduce. If you go with the framework like EGF, uh, there are other, other frameworks as well, you know, they help write code generators. You may sometimes find yourself, you know, in a situation that 
there are cases of one being with Han, or you could always have to go back to the people that have provided the code generating them to deal with that. But with uh, uh, this approach, you know, uh, Will be one friendly to support the co generation engine. What we do this uh, approach is that the uh, app will be able to generate almost anything and it will be able to debug because, of course, you will need to write your own tests. When you bring the co generation engine to the production, you need to make sure that there are no bugs. How are you going to debug and test? Every time you call generation engine before you release it, if you use a call generation template or a framework, you might not be able to write, you know, tests in that framework. So you want to test the call generation. So that's why we feel we think we have more flexibility to write the call generation engine. Any problem you land with that, don't make any assumptions that you should. This is the approach of all the things. See, we started, as Dimitris has mentioned, you know, we started uh, using the template engine, like the AHP and JHP type of template engine to generate code. But as we were moving along and starting to learn more complex systems, we realized that such an approach has limits. Then, when you have thousands of clients that template engine, it's difficult to be able to understand what will generate that file. And that makes it more difficult to debug that code. So that's why we went back to this hybrid mode. Uh, we have templates for the easy uh, stuff we have to generate, which is straightforward. And when it comes to more difficult part, then you are free programming and solving it to generate before it's necessary for it to know this stuff. Do you do any linting, not just meta linting, more than anything else? If you look, look at the code now, there's a, there's a dead import, which is the put at the top of it. Yes, yes. So uh, if you want to deliver, say, the, the minimal code, I've just read all my, my code generations. Is there any feedback you give on all the code you generate uh, results in dead imports? Or Something like that. Is that something we do? Or is that something perhaps on the stack for it too? Uh, feedback at, at, which, at which process? During the, so when, when you suppose I write my code generator. Okay, right? yes. And, uh, and, and I am not particularly careful so the way that I declare my, my import generation code. And all of a sudden I'm pulling in 600 megabytes of extra dependency yes, that I'm yes. not using. That's, uh, and the a code link would be able to say, well, look, you're doing those inputs, you're never using them, right? You, you can't set up your projects uh, to complain. Is yes. that something that, that you do as well? It's, it's, it's on the pipeline. We don't do it right now. It's a, a responsibility of the developer of the, uh, the developer of the code facility to, to do it. But we could uh, link it, hit uh, somehow the developer that he imports stuff he doesn't use. Now, I can imagine in that kind of it's something like the meta engineering cycle. Yes. I'm, I'm building my uh, I'm a new bit of code generation stuff. So that's the kind of feedback and this too. does the code compile is also is the code minimum. On, on a specific implementation strategy, we use an existing linter, and when the code generation process finishes, it parses the result and removes all the, the stuff that is not used. So we do it in a way. Yes, and this is the way you, you compress it again. Exactly. You yes. Don't, uh, yes. You don't hard feed this back to the yes. person writing it generally. Sometimes the compiler handles itself. Uh, when uh, imports that are not used are just declared, it uh, throws them away. Thing, would you use it when you create the view model? Try to optimize the code. But stop the same decline. Yes. Yes, we use uh, that. So you, 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 you have the flexibility to run any kind of optimization, yeah. you know, uh, before you generate the actual code. So you see, you can understand from the models and the semantics that the developer has put into the meta, to the modeling uh, environment, and then you can run. You know, you can apply any kind of optimization you think is appropriate for that technology stack. This is a kind of a knowledge that you cannot expect from all the developers that are writing in the technology. That is one of the, 
main benefits, I think, of the method of the model driven engineering because you have acquired some knowledge of you have some experience which junior developers might not have it, and it might be more difficult to try to uh, educate them to write in a certain way. So, yeah, this code generation is compiler optimization for the level up, isn't it? Pardon me? It's similar to compiler optimization. For yeah, the level exactly. Up. Yeah. exactly. So this approach this is gives you that flexibility as well. So this is not so one thing I find interesting about what you've been showing is is your flexibility with regard to what you use for writing your code generation. Yes. Right. Um uh, and I guess you hinted out that you could do it in Java, you showed it yes. just doing it in CS, uh, I guess in theory you could could probably do it with uh, exactly. epsilon if you wanted to. Um, but how does something integrate into your wider platform? I, I'm assuming there's, there's there's going to be some sort of API, some sort of yes, mechanism yes, for, that for for getting an, an implementation strategy yes. going somehow, right? How yes. does that integrate? There is a very, very thin uh, layer, a service layer. Your implementation strategy needs to expose in order to integrate with the other platform. That's a set of methods for uh, the description of the implementation strategy, an operation to start the generation, an operation to view the files that are generated, and some other technical stuff about the database, etc. How and does it exchange model information with the with, the uh, with a JSON format? We serialize the model, the meta model as a JSON, and the implementation strategy stages. We serialize it to back and uh, start the generation process. Does that, how does that scale as the models work? Uh, because the, the JSON can become quite big. Uh, we have two uh, methods. The, the first one is this with the, the JSON. The second one is that the implementation strategy has a reference to the library that creates the model. And instead of taking as input the, meta, the whole meta model, it takes the, the path of the application. So from the source of the models. It loads the models and creates the meta model itself. So the meta model is not serialized and transferred. Uh, right. And this is quite scalable. We have a cell drive with the meta models and all the implementation strategies access this cell drive and actually pull the, the model which are not big uh, are not big and then create the meta model. And I think I think you know on the in the spirit of what, what Chris was asking, which I think is about the, the general services around the, the transformation and generation pipeline, right? Um, you mentioned before, I think, in response to Dimitri's question, I think it was that, that you're doing incremental. Okay. Yes. Is that something that the platform provides outside of those implementation strategies, or is it something that one has to build into the implementation strategy somehow? How, it's how in the middle. Manage that? The, the, the subject platform provides some information about what changed, but the developer of the implementation strategy is responsible to use this information to skip some generation parts. So some, some parts are done by the platform, but the generation engine, engine needs to consume them. So, so the implementation strategy that you built at the moment doesn't yes. do that. No, this code is doesn't do the checks. So how, what would it take to change that implementation strategy to consider consider the implementing uh, information? I would go to the the higher level, the engine level. Let me check. On I will go on this layer and I will consume this information. I will add this code inside an if and say if the domain model changed, do this. Alios, uh, otherwise it uh, skips this part. And I can go deeper inside this generate method. And here, which iterate, iterates each entity, I could skip the entities that are not uh, provided as changed. So they come with some meta information? Yes, yes, it's in the session object, yes. Okay. And they have a, a, a timestamp property, so the coding facility can check if it has already generated, it has a, a newer or older version of the latest change. So if it has a, a newer version, it keeps uh, this version. If it's outdated, it generates again the code. 
but the developer of the implementation strategy needs to encode this into his uh, strategy. Because we could do that in the metaphorical implementation strategy. We can provide this type of facilities if we know everybody will use this to the right decoding facility. Mm -hmm. But because we don't want to make that decision and force everybody to use just one single framework, then uh, this is part of the guidance mm -hmm. and SDKs and things we help developers to write their own coding facility. Because the coding facility can become a very powerful tool in your organization, it can generate almost everything and can handle any change of the flat specific models. For the CSRP SDK, we have the helper methods that uh, uh, facilitate this uh, option. I've got a question. Yes. On, on that point about how powerful it is, I was struggling because it's not really my background, this type of yes. programming, but you say, do you see, so you see as a use case where You've got a large organization where they've got different code bases written in different languages mm -hmm. that's the main that's one of the biggest use cases basically is that you'd have this central model and you'd be able to update it and just all generate lots of different implementations uh, that's in the same organization. that's a use case that's yeah. not the main use case but okay. that's one of the use cases what would yes. you say is the main use case then? I, I would say it is that you you write some code today and in five or ten years your code your actual code is uh, updated. It uses the latest technologies. It is uh, fast, with whatever fast means for that uh, period. I think that's the main uh, advantage of this. The example is Visual Basic 6. We used to have an implementation strategy uh, generating Visual Basic 6 and uh, ASP, all that technology stack Microsoft used to provide 10, 15 years ago. And then we managed to change that completely. We kept all the models, uh, like big systems, ERP type systems, and finance and management systems. And we, and we have customers that uh, are using the third and constantly change the code base. Now they used to write this Visual Basic 6, and now they are writing .NET 4. Big improvement since they can, you know, all stack has changed, all architecture is completely new. The code is completely new. And the minister hasn't shown the unit test and everything. So you can write also unit and you can test your, your, your models as well. So that is quite useful when you are dealing with big systems and at the same time you have to deal with the changes in the uh, technology arena. I mean, now we have Nest, I don't know if you're familiar, it's, it's, it's a brilliant framework now. The, over the next uh, JS, yes, you know, the JavaScript is having a, a, an enterprise framework, like .NET, it's Nest, so it becomes more popular, very popular. So that's why the minister is trying to show here how easy it is to move from .NET environment to a completely different environment without really changing all the changes of the infrastructure, if you like, and the handling of the coding facility. And so, so when you have a, uh, you have a good confidence there because you can run unit tests in this code. You can test this code before you transform the models. So, so to what degree is this then essentially throwing evolution over the wall up to, to the higher level, right? Because you're saying, look, if you write your code mm -hmm. using our platform, mm -hmm. you get um, Dependency updates and all that kind of stuff. You, you, you affect your model as a source of truth, and the code you just regenerate if something changes, yeah, exactly. which is fine. Um, but then the evolution will have to happen one level up, right? Because at some point there might be some breaking changes. Or that happens, like that. yes. So uh, I can see on the one side that you're removing evolution on the, the normal level, but if it goes on the level up, then the question is is it better to have it there? Uh, is it more painful, potentially, because it's harder to evolve code generators, I would imagine, than to evolve base code? It feels like there's a trade-off there. Do you have any, any insight? Of course it? there is, but uh, the code generation is only written once. You might have a million applications, 100 applications. You change the implementation strategy once, all the implementation strategies, all the applications rebuild and are uh, updated. And the user of the, the developer of the Zadev, the user that develops application of the Zadev, it doesn't understand this, doesn't have to go through all this pain of updating. 
So from, from your experiences, yeah, uh, do you find it hard to evolve your, your platform in response to changes? Uh, if you do it regularly, uh, it's not hard. If you have to make a big leap from, uh, from VB to .NET Core, it would be a big change. Mm -hmm. But if you have changed VB to .NET 2, etc., that's a, it can be handled. And the changes are not always on the on the libraries and the frameworks. Uh, a new technology might arise, uh, like the messaging queues, and you can replace your whole service layer with message uh, adapter with PubSub or add an option to the implementation strategy if the user wants to generate PubSub or uh, traditional REST APIs. Again, the user doesn't have to do anything on the subdev side. He just clicks a button and the code is generated with the new technology. What about the aspects of the system in this case? Then you can find textual alternatives to you know, like yes. prioritize performance or prioritize yes. HA or something like that. How would you go about that in terms of generating alternatives? Alternatives, uh, alternative architecture. So, in fact, you could say, well, I, I can generate Java five or... different ways in, in Nest, but this one has high performance, this one has high availability. Yes. Uh, we have uh, for .NET Core, exa for example, we have two or three versions, which the user selects them by some options, checkboxes. Some are uh, we propose for specific use cases, use this checkbox, etc. We have done the experiments. We have seen that this one works faster on these use cases. We have added all this logic in the implementation strategy, and the user just clicks the button to enable this feature. Can't you control that in the configuration file? You have in the yeah, yes. Here we have, I think it's all hidden, but let's check. On this strategy, maybe. For example, here we have an, a new experimental feature we're using, uh, where we generate a sync code on the .NET uh, platform. All the REST APIs are async, etc. Uh, so the user just clicks here, and all his code is transformed uh, to this stack. But this doesn't always mean it's faster. It's based on the use case. On some use cases, this all, uh, really brings uh, huge uh, performance improvements. On some other cases, not so big. You have a way the option to configure your implementation strategy and expose certain features to the actual developer. And as we said, that depends also on the use case you have. You may have simpler applications where these features are essential and have to be big, and there are other use cases that are not so important. So you can even so you have flexibility to configure the actual code generation. There's no one style, you know, one size fits the most. So you have to so it gives you that flexibility. Any more questions? Yes. Please. So we we built um, a Jake Morgan a proprietary K generator that looks slightly similar to what you have, in the sense that you interpret a meta model and you generate strings. Yes. Right. Um, now <coughs> our meta model is huge, and then what we end up doing is in the K generator we have an intermediate tree representation for just what we need to generate the code that we and therefore, yes. uh, so, you, so you, when you're generating a class, yes. there's finite ways of generating yes. a class as imports, as attributes. So, is there a, an opportunity to really sort of, well, is, is there an open source standard that we could move towards if someone's prepared to do it? To write an implementation strategy? Well, as, like an interface for a code generator along with. Met model that you would need to do it. Uh, if I understood the question correctly, we are now in the process of making open source all the C -Sharp SDK. So if someone wants to write an implementation strategy in C -Sharp, could you use this SDK? Yeah, it says that you could take any meta model in the world and then map it to yes, the yes. 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 representation that generates. To our meta model. Yes. And so and the, from there you can reduce the Yes, this is actually the way we've done it. We've done a use case with the combo. Yeah. It, 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 although we didn't have a meta model, we had a source code. Of the, of the 
geographically we we extract the coal coal and we map it into the mammoth coal. So the meta model of the mammoth language and then from there you generate they wanted another version of cobalt mm -hmm. so hard to the cobalt. So is we took the north version of a cobalt and we transform it to a new version of a cobalt. But at the same time, we were able to generate C sharp as well. So they saw how the node fashion system can change, can be transformed to the one cobalt, so they had to cobalt it, but they also had the opportunity to use more more than that to take it and move to more healthier type of systems. What sort of applications are generated? I'm, I'm thinking about the user interface, right? Because that, that usually requires a lot of manual adaptation. It's difficult to automate it because it could. Uh, I understand that it's it can be done. So the approach is is uh, it work and uh, it's working, and uh, I think that your framework is. is but I'm wondering what is the scope of the application? Yes. How much? What, what sort of applications can be solved with your framework? Um, and the follow-up question would be, how could you uh, extend it in order to add? Very, very good question. Uh, uh, some years before, it used to generate a more uh, business-like applications, crude, etc., and more big systems, but uh, back-office systems that didn't use uh, complex UI. And now we have uh, extended the options of the format deck, and you can create custom controls. So you can create whatever uh, UI uh, you want. There, uh, there is actually no restriction. Uh, you, have, you can create libraries of custom controls and reuse them. And so you can design any UI you want. Uh, also, the, uh, the language for the UI is the CSS, the less we use. So you can fetch existing less code or write uh, new less code, CSS code, and reuse it. So there is actually no, no limit to the UI you, you want to design. So you have a meta model for the UI component? Yes, there's a whole meta model. I didn't say, uh, show this, but there's a whole meta model for the uh, UI components. If there is time, we can show that as well. But if not, I just want to try to this, that CSS is the only language that uh, we kept it in the whole framework. There's no, there's no way, there's no reason uh, to abstract CSS. So we kept CSS. So within that there, if you want to extend the user interface and create anything you like, so you can use CSS. But for any other language, we use MAM. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice demonstration and interact well interactive dynamic 